Ireland in the mid 17th century, a troubled country, torn apart by a bloody civil war that ravaged the three kingdoms of England, Scotland and Ireland. A massacre of Protestants by Catholic rebels in 1641, fused with an underlying ethnic hatred of the native Irish, provided the pretext for an English reconquest of the islands. At the head of the invading army was Oliver Cromwell, England's greatest general, who vowed to seek revenge on the barbarous Irish. This is a righteous judgment of God upon these barbarous wretches who have embrued their hands in so much innocent blood. The massacres at Drogheda and Wexford were a shocking statement of intent. The imposing coalition of Catholic Confederates and Protestant Royalists under the Marquis of Ormond appeared unable to meet the threat. Array! Marshal! But the Ulster Irish were now on the march. A detachment of 2,000 men, led by Hugh Dove O'Neill, headed south to confront Oliver Cromwell. Although Cromwell's campaign had made an immediate and dramatic impact, the military conquest would clear the way for even bigger changes in Ireland that would reverberate through the centuries to the present day. After two months in Ireland, Cromwell controlled much of the eastern and southern coastline. He had hoped to use Wexford as a base, but it was uninhabitable after days of pillaging by his troops. As the weather worsened, the new model army was forced to seek winter quarters elsewhere. As winter closed in, the weather worsened. In Ormond's words, the new model army began to feel the bite of colonel hunger and major sickness. Worse was to follow. Cromwell estimated that he had only 3,000 soldiers fit for battle. Clearly, the new model army was not invulnerable. <coughs> A considerable part of your army is fitter for the hospital than the field. The enemy know it, yet they know not what to do. Exposed to the heavy rains of October 1649, he pressed on to his next target, Waterford. As the rain continued to fall, dirt roads turned into quagmires, making it impossible for Cromwell to move his heavy siege guns overland. He decided instead to make an approach by sea. It was here at Duncannon that the New Model Army suffered its first major setback of the Irish campaign. The garrison included the first detachment of Ulster troops to arrive in Munster, and they provided much needed backbone to the demoralised Royalist forces. Cromwell's son in law, Henry Ireton, attacked the fort with 2,000 men, but was beaten back. Despite the setbacks at Duncannon and Waterford, Cromwell could reflect with some satisfaction on his progress over the previous four months. As one contemporary commentator wrote, he had passed like a lightning through the land. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come unto thee. Hide not thy face from me in the day when I am in trouble. Incline thy ear unto me in the day when I call, answer me speedily. 
For my days are consumed like smoke, and my bones are burned as a hearth. My heart is smitten and withered like grass, so that I forget to eat my bread. The new year, 1650, saw Cromwell receive badly needed reinforcements of troops and supplies from England. The new model army is not qualitatively different from any other infantry formation. What it has behind it, I suppose I would summarize with four words. Money, ships, siege guns, horses, and a fifth word, money again. He has got the ability to bring men, munitions, and provisions anywhere on the Irish coast. That gives him huge strategic flexibility. And it's interesting, when he moves away from the coast, things become more difficult. In quick succession, Cromwell captured a string of major royalist towns across Munster and South Leinster, including the former Confederate capital at Kilkenny. Kilkenny is captured and it capitulates ultimately, but it was a hard-fought siege. The issues in the war have been clarified. Cromwell has made clear he will not be granting religious toleration. Many of the Protestants, uh, Protestants and English on the royalist side have either moved over to the Cromwellian side or have withdrawn from the war. So it's become more purely an Irish-English ethnic conflict. So there's a greater element of desperation in the resistance. Only Limerick, Waterford and Clonmel still held out in Munster. Cromwell's noose was now tightening around Clonmel. He was confident that he could take the town without difficulty. But events soon proved him wrong. Clonmel was defended by 1,200 Ulster Catholic troops under the command of Hugh O'Neill, nephew of Owen Rowe. Make ready. Hugh Dove O'Neill. He's enormously experienced in siege warfare, the siege warfare that was practised in the Spanish Netherlands, and he's a veteran of, uh, of warfare there. So he knows his siege warfare 101. When you see a breach being made in the walls, you build a retrenchment or V-shaped retrograde behind it, man the mouth and the sides, and put a cannon firing case shot and chain shot at the end and wait for him to come in. Clomel boasted formidable defences. Swampland to the east and west and the River Shore to the south provided excellent natural protection. Cromwell was forced to place his heavy cannon on the high ground to the north. And after weeks of preparation, he unleashed a savage bombardment against the town. The artillery soon smashed a breach in the north wall. The soldiers of the new model army prepared for a full frontal assault. O'Neill, anticipating the point at which the breach would be made, created a classic killing ground. A long, narrow corridor here on Short Street blocked at one end, where artillery and musketeers could fire at will into the massed ranks of advancing parliamentary troops. They fire and they side into the mass of troops pouring in. Squirrel! 
They're elbow to elbow. So that when these cannons fire a firing chain shot, they can't miss. And what goes horribly wrong for Cromwell's troops at Clonmel is that not once, but twice, he sends in large bodies of troops into that death trap. This is going on all day long. There may be up to 3,000 men dead and wounded as a result of that, that, that day's business. That's from an army of besiegers of perhaps 10,000 men. That's, that's, there's no question about it. It's the biggest reverse he suffered in England or Ireland. In one day, the New Model Army had lost more soldiers than in years of conflict during the English Civil War. But O'Neill's triumph proved short-lived. His forces exhausted after the day's fighting, their ammunition spent, and with no hope of relief, O'Neill decided to abandon the town. He crossed the River Shore under the cover of darkness and headed south towards Waterford leaving the mayor to negotiate surrender terms with Cromwell. Cromwell had had an amazing um, 10 years of fighting without a, a major setback until he, until he stormed Clonmel and was caught in a trap. I think he, he simply came up against a wily commander who induced him to overreach himself. Clonmel exposed Cromwell's limitations as a military commander. In a siege situation, he only had one tactic, full frontal assault. If that failed, there was no plan B. He's a good cavalry officer. He can spot a developing situation, he can spot an opportunity, and he can seize it. He's far less competent, I would even say he's incompetent, in siege warfare. And as we saw at Clonmel, dangerously so. Cromwell unaware of O'Neill's flight, began to negotiate surrender terms with the town's mayor, John White. Tell me, does this Hugh O'Neill know of your presence here? He does not. He went two hours after dark with all his men. You knave. You served me this petition before, yet you only tell me this now. If His Excellency had demanded the question, I would have told him. Who is this O'Neill? Dove O'Neill. He's an overseas soldier, born in Spain. Damn you and your overseas. I hope His Excellency does not break his conditions or take them from him, which is not the repute His Excellency has, but to perform whatsoever he has promised. It's really important in terms of his own argument. Surrender, and I will give you just terms refuse to surrender and I'll massacre you. Now, Clonmel, he is put to the test. Will the English keep their word? And it's very, very important that he does keep his word. In a way, what he does at Clonmel is as important as what he did at Drogheda. Fierce Irish resistance in the early months of 1650 had forced Cromwell to adopt a more moderate strategy. He offered increasingly generous terms of surrender in order to avoid heavy losses, such as those at Clonmel. Cromwell's cavalry pursued O'Neill's retreating troops. They failed to overtake the main force, but killed hundreds of the camp followers.
While Cromwell had sworn to pursue O'Neill, he would in fact never meet his Irish nemesis in battle again. The conquest of Ireland was far from complete, but Parliament demanded Cromwell's immediate return. Trouble was brewing in Scotland. Charles Stuart, whose father had been executed by Cromwell in Parliament, had made an alliance with the Scottish Presbyterians. He was determined to regain his father's throne by invading England. As the Scots assembled a large army north of the border, Parliament decided on a preemptive strike to be led by Cromwell. Ireland was once united to England. Englishmen had good inheritances, which many of them purchased with their money and good leases. They lived peaceably and honestly among you. You broke this union. You, unprovoked, put the English to the most unheard of and most barbarous massacre, without respect of sex or age that ever the sun beheld. It is a fig leaf of pretense that they fight for their king, when really they fight in protection of men of so much prodigious blood. Men who have declared the ground of their fighting to be bellum prelaticum et religiosum. You are a part of Antichrist, whose kingdom, the scripture so expressly states, shall be laid in blood, yea, in the blood of the saints. We are come to ask an account of the innocent blood that hath been shed. We come to break the power of a company of lawless rebels. We come by the assistance of God to hold forth and to maintain the luster and glory of English liberty in a nation where we have an undoubted right to it. He denied that he had come to wipe out the ordinary Irish people, but failed to acknowledge that his soldiers had killed many unarmed civilians. For many people, Cromwell's campaign on Ireland begins and ends with those notorious massacres, but they only form part of the story. In England, the Parliament had already begun to lay the groundwork for legislation that would change Ireland forever. But before any measures could be implemented, the Irish had to be defeated militarily. The task of completing the conquest now fell to Cromwell's son-in-law, Henry Ireton, the new parliamentary commander-in-chief. Henry Arton, who of course is Cromwell's son-in-law, had been very close to him for about 10 years. He'd been a loyal lieutenant from uh, the very early months of the, of the war. Uh, he himself came from a very similar social background, slightly better educated. He's much more systematic than, than Oliver. And I think that comes across in Ireland too, that I think he is the one who is thinking much more deeply, not simply about the need to punish those responsible for the previous rebellion, but what form that punishment should take. He adopted a more cautious approach to the campaign, moving slowly but relentlessly inland towards the final natural line of defence available to the Irish, the River Shannon. In Ulster, however, news of Hugh Dove's success at Clonmel, followed closely by Cromwell's departure, gave the native Irish a newfound confidence. With Hugh Dove still in Munster, army officers elected the charismatic Bishop of Clogher, Heber McMahon, as their new leader. A talented politician with no military experience, he now commanded the only force that could face the parliamentarians in the field. On the 21st of June, at Scarif Hollis near Letterkenny, McMahon faced a parliamentary army commanded by an Irish Protestant, Charles Coote. But McMahon, ignoring the advice of more experienced officers, made a catastrophic blunder and ordered his troops to attack Coote on the lower ground. 
The Irish fought bravely, but eventually were overwhelmed. Thousands were killed on the battlefield. Coote lost just 100 men. The hopes of the native Irish died on the battlefield of Scaravallis. McMahon managed to escape, but was subsequently captured and hanged. Onro's only son, Henry, was also taken prisoner and dragged before Coote, who ordered his immediate execution, along with other leading officers. Give! Give! McMahon's entire force had been destroyed. Never again would they take the field against the new model army. Instead, they resorted to a guerrilla war, using the mountains, bogs and woods as cover to attack the parliamentarians. These soldiers were now called Tories, from the Irish word for outlaws. The model that we see of the Cromwellian Reconquest is of the apparently inexorable capture of towns, the movement of the front lines from east to west. That's a false way of looking at it, because as the Cromwellians advance, it's like they're pushing through a sea that closes behind them. They're leaving a countryside which is largely in the control of the remnants of the Irish royalist forces, or Tories if you will. In the face of successive defeats, the loose coalition, headed by the Marquess of Ormond, began to fall apart. Protestant royalists made their peace with Parliament, while Catholics became increasingly critical of their leader. These military failures begin to breed in the native Irish such aversion to your majesty's authority and to me, to whom all their misfortunes, the negligence, cowardice and treachery of others are attributed. Ormond's position had become untenable. He fled to France at the end of the year. The conflict in Ireland, therefore, became a more straightforward struggle between Irish Catholics and English Protestants. An increasingly bitter conflict now centred on the city of Limerick, commanded by Hugh Dove O'Neill, hero of Clonmel and nemesis of the New Model Army. The scene was now set for another epic encounter. No mission! No mission! No Having succeeded Cromwell as a parliamentary commander in Ireland, Henry Arden made his approach towards Limerick. In June 1651, Arton crossed the Shannon north of the city, while the Navy transported the crucial heavy artillery to the siege. I want this town completely surrounded. I Despite a prolonged bombardment, the heavily reinforced walls could not be breached. Instead, Arton settled for a long siege, encircling the city with close to 11,000 men. Limerick would be starved into submission. Our message should be made perfectly clear. We're not leaving until these people submit to our will. Trapped within the walls of Limerick, 28,000 people were now crammed into a city built to hold 5,000. As Ireton's cordon tightened around the city, the supply of food ran low. Many resorted to eating horse flesh or whatever else was available. Hugh Dove O'Neill's task is to stretch out his food supplies as long as possible. And predictably, although rather cold-heartedly, Hugh Dove tried to get rid of what are often co what are called useless mouths from the city. Older people, women and children. 
and he physically drove them from the city. Hundreds of civilians tried to flee, but Ireton hanged scores of these unfortunate refugees from makeshift gallows within sight of the walls. There was another reason why Ireton wanted to prevent a civilian exodus from Limerick, one that filled all the protagonists with terror, the plague. Plague had come to Ireland on a Spanish merchant ship in the summer of 1649, preceding Cromwell's arrival by a few short weeks. It spread quickly throughout the country, thriving in the cramped urban areas. Soon, the disease was rampant among the undernourished and overcrowded population of Limerick. Despite crude protective measures, such as plague masks stuffed with herbs, there was little doctors could do for the victims of this terrible disease. Initially, when plague broke out in the Irish quarters, the Cromwellians took this as a sign of God's favour towards their cause, that God was intervening on their part. But, predictably, plague and other epidemic diseases broke out on their side as well. So if you can imagine thousands of men encamped in the same area, it, it becomes a hotbed of epidemic disease. Summer turned to winter. Hopes for reinforcements from the Duke of Lorraine began to fade and news reached Limerick of Cromwell's crushing victory over Charles II at the Battle of Worcester. The last possibility of help from abroad had gone. Hugh Dove was left with no choice and he finally surrendered to Ireton on the 27th of October, 1651. The siege had exacted a terrible toll on the city's population. As many as 8,000 people had died. Most of the surviving soldiers were allowed to march away unharmed, but Ireton singled out over 20 officers, civic officials and clergy for execution. A court-martial would decide the fate of Hugh Dove O'Neill. Whereas the army belonging to the Parliament of England has appointed a tribunal of justice for the trying of Hugh Dove O'Neill on the charge of the obstinate holding out of the city of Limerick, and prolonging unnecessarily this war against the army of the Parliament of England and for other terrors. What does the prisoner have to say in his defence? This war was long on before I came over. I came at the invitation of my countrymen, and I've always conducted myself as a fair enemy. You encouraged this city to hold out, even when there was no hope of relief. I always advised a timely surrender, and I hoped I would enjoy exemption under the articles that were agreed. Confident of this, I faithfully delivered up to you the keys to the town with all the arms, ammunition and provisions without embezzlement and my own person also to your mercy. The exchanges at Limerick over what to do with O'Neill is very, very interesting and I think um, again show what, that there was mutual respect between the combatants by the end of the war. They say, no, you know, we must be men of our word, we respect this man. Um, this man gave us a fair fight and we gave him generous terms and we can't uh, subsequently renege on those promises. It is consented to save the life of the prisoner. Yet this court doth adjudge that he be conveyed into confinement in England. I think it's a hinge event in the war. Thereafter, the Irish continued to fight, but they're not fighting to win. They're, any realistic chance of winning has by then vanished. They're fighting out of desperation, fighting to secure acceptable conditions, some form of acceptable capitulation with the English Commonwealth. Ireton's euphoria at the capture of Limerick didn't last long. He contracted a fever and died just a few weeks later. Ironically, Hugh Dove O'Neill accompanied the body to London as a prisoner. His war was over. Hugh Dove spent three years in the Tower of London, 
but was eventually released and lived out the remainder of his days in Spain. Galway, the only sizable town still in Catholic hands, surrendered early the following year, but the fighting continued. Large Tory bands, sometimes numbering many thousands of men, continued to wage guerrilla war in the hope of forcing better terms from Parliament. Faced with an ongoing guerrilla war, the parliamentarians targeted the local Catholic population for supplying the Tories. The dividing line between civilians and soldiers became increasingly blurred, and many of the atrocities of the war date from this period. The land was divided into protected areas and enemy zones earmarked for destruction. As they advanced westwards, the new model army used a scorched earth strategy, reducing large parts of the country to a state of famine. Their response was drastic. Attack the agricultural infrastructure, slash and burn, kill cattle, steal cattle, drive out the peasants, insist that they not live within those areas, and if they do so insist or do so attempt, kill them. Hundreds of civilians were hanged in Tipperary alone. Their only crime? To be found within an enemy zone. Travellers in the countryside witnessed scenes of total devastation. The execution via soil on here there. Costas Buinte in the Chine, Egan Nermach. Transport, transplant, ma miauer er verla. Shoot him, kill him, strip him, tear him. A Tory, hack him, hang him, a rebel, a rogue, a thief, a priest, a papist. There was now a startling new development one that challenges traditional perceptions of the Cromwellian conquest. Despite the ethnic and religious hatreds that had infused the war, significant numbers of Irish Catholics now began to join the new model army. They did so as a result of physical necessity rather than political conviction. Starving and desperate, at least in the army, they were guaranteed regular meals and protection from persecution. Their own forces ravaged by disease, the parliamentarians gladly accepted these new recruits. Unable to defeat the Tories, Parliament eventually gave them the option of emigrating overseas into the service of foreign armies. As many as 40,000 Irishmen went into voluntary exile. Most never saw their native land again. In April 1653, the last remaining Irish stronghold at Clochurter in County Cavan surrendered. The war was effectively over. On Coga de Chriach Nigera is the Quirin the Milti Vigiri Derka, the reply is Gurta in Endacht. In the four years since Cromwell's arrival, the population of Ireland had declined by as much as a quarter through hunger, disease and fighting. The extent of the destruction was such that Ireland had become a blank slate upon which the Cromwellians could write whatever they chose. Ireland was increasingly perceived as the unstable element in the three jurisdictions of England, Scotland and Ireland. And therefore, major changes have to be introduced in the ownership of property and in the control of the population to ensure that a, an insurrection similar to what had occurred in 1641 never happens again. 
while the last bitter phase of the war was being played out, the English Parliament put the finishing touches to an act for the settling of Ireland. It would be unlike any other piece of legislation Ireland had ever seen. Irish Catholic landowners, their families and dependents, were to be transplanted west of the Shannon, corralled into an enclosed area, sealed off from the sea, from which they could no longer threaten their conquerors. To hell or to Connacht. The choice of Connacht as a kind of a native reservation, as it were, was based on Cromwellian perceptions of the importance of the Shannon line, that Tomond or Clare and Connacht together could be controlled or corralled. The Act of Settlement, which follows uh, the conquest of Ireland, is one of the most radical pieces of legislation ever passed in the history of the British Isles. It attempts to carry out a complete social revolution on the scale of the French Revolution. It's something which never happens in England, dispossessing the majority of the landowners in the country, that's the Catholics, and handing over their land, mostly to English newcomers in theory. And that there is this kind of uh, idea that when the landowners go, the native population will drift away as well. They can be persuaded to depart, uh, leaving room for the English to settle, which is certainly a final solution and all the dread implications of that term to the Irish problem. Initially, indeed, it is proposed to transplant the entire, to extirpate, to uproot the entire Irish population and send them to the native reservation, as it were, behind the Shannon in Tomond and, and Connacht. That didn't happen on the scale envisaged, or anything like the scale envisaged, largely because, I suppose, a mixture of humanitarian motives and also practical motives that the new incoming settlers needed a labour supply in the context where, albeit there was huge migration from England, it wasn't sufficient to populate the countryside. Economically, they're a hugely significant period and we see the economic superiority as well as obviously the political superiority of uh, London. Ireland is no longer a kingdom, it really is a colony. There's an enormous transfer of land and wealth from the native population owned something like 60% of Ireland's soil in 1641. By the time the Cromwellian settlement is finished, that's down to maybe 10%. 12%. That's an enormous transfer of wealth, resources and political power which proves enduring. The Protestant ascendancy of the 18th and early 19th century was established by Cromwell. It is the war that finishes Ireland. Uh, it's uh, the great shift from being uh, a nation which socially and economically is dominated by Catholics to one which is in the hands of the Protestants, say for a short blip around 1690 until 1922. During the 1650s, thousands of Catholic women and children, many of them destitute and homeless, were shipped across the Atlantic. Their fate? To work on the sugar plantations in the Caribbean. This trade in human cargo also served as a means of clearing the country of vagrants and convicts. Estimates suggest that by the 1660s, as many as 50,000 Irish had been transported to the New World. Having defeated the Scots and the Irish, Cromwell ruled over the three kingdoms for much of the 1650s as a virtual military dictator with the title of Lord Protector. On the 3rd of September, 1658, Oliver Cromwell died in his bed, surrounded by family members, a privilege denied to most of his Irish opponents. He received a lavish state funeral and was buried at Westminster Abbey. With Cromwell gone, 
Charles II seized the opportunity to return from exile. Large crowds welcomed him back to London in May 1660. The king ordered the bodies of Cromwell and Ireton to be exhumed, put through the ritual of execution and dumped in an unmarked grave. An ignominious end that few of his Irish victims would have mourned. It would be 200 years before Cromwell's reputation was re-evaluated by his own countrymen. Charles II effectively restored traditional monarchical government, as though the civil wars had never happened. In Ireland, however, the confirmation of the Cromwellian land settlement meant there would be no turning back. The curse of Cromwell is a modern invention. It wasn't that Cromwell was popular with the Irish at the time. Uh, he was certainly complained about and resented and feared. What changes everything is that in the, the 19th century, the British make Cromwell a hero for the first time. Until then, he's a villain. The Irish don't have much reason to pick on him in particular. If the English don't like him, you may as well go for someone like William III, William of Orange, who actually is a hero to the English. But the Victorians turn Cromwell into the epitome of the democratic, godly, imperialist Englishman, uh, which is why he's got the statue in front of the door to the House of Commons and nobody else has. And being thus elevated by the English as their 17th century hero, it is absolutely inevitable that the Irish nationalists will take him out in response. And that's what happens. That's why he becomes a curse at that time. For the English historian A.J.P. Taylor, writing on the 300th anniversary of Cromwell's death, Ireland was the one great blot on the man's reputation, and his actions there, beyond all excuse, are explanation. Taylor believed that the curse of Cromwell would still be remembered when all his other achievements had long been forgotten. Cromwell's greatest legacy in Ireland uh, is twofold. The first is the Protestant ascendancy, which is, is there until the 20th century. Uh, there is no doubt about that. This is the time at which Protestants are installed as the major landowners, the pretty well sold political power, the masters of the island. But uh, there's also the double legacy that uh, no real attempt is made to convert the natives. Uh, they are simply left as serfs. Uh, as uh, producers uh, for the new masters, which is creating a situation of inherent instability. It's two nations, it's two religions, it's two societies. Uh, and sooner or later, it's got a blow. <laughs> it is not a viable long-term uh, regime. And uh, that's precisely what Cromwell sets up. It's very easy for Cromwell to take the blame for what was done by the English more generally. I mean, part of my worry is that if you blame Cromwell, you don't, as it were, distribute blame uh, broadly enough. I mean, there is a horrendous uh, outcome, which is that over 40% of the land was transferred from Catholics born in, in Ireland to Protestants born in England. That's not one man's doing and it's not man, one man's responsibility. So if we, if we move away from an obsession with what happened at Drogheda to the much more broader question of, of, of the horrendous long-term consequences for the inhabitants of this island, um, of the uh, English conquest, then we, we need to place responsibility far more generally um, on the English and on all kinds of different groups within England. If you look at Cromwell's war guilt, if you want to use that, that, that a contemporary phrase, I would look less to Drogheda and Wexford than to the whole war. The war was enormously costly in civilian lives, who either died directly or more, much less, indirectly as a result of famine and famine-related epidemics. This famine was a result of the counterinsurgency campaign, the long protracted program of reconquest. Why was it so protracted? Because Cromwell insisted on unconditional surrender and he didn't have to do so and by insisting on unconditional surrender that led inevitably to a very protracted war and in that sense I think there's a direct link between the severity of the war and the human cost which is in my view 
of the order of one quarter to one fifth of the native population perished in the years 1650, 51, 52 and into 53. That is Cromwell's legacy. Cromwell's uncompromising attitude to all Catholics, native Irish and old English alike, helped forge a common identity in adversity and lay the foundations for modern Irish nationalism. And this unquestionably is one of his most important legacies. A warrior of Christ, somewhat like the Crusaders of medieval Europe, he acted as God's executioner, exacting revenge and crushing all opposition, convinced throughout of the legitimacy of his cause and striving to build a better world for the chosen few. In many ways, therefore, he remains a remarkably modern figure, relevant to our understanding of both the past and the present. Somebody to be closely studied and understood, rather than revered or reviled.